Hello, my, I'm Eric Rosenbaum here. I am the Chief Technologist in the Global FSI Practice for Red Hat. Uh, we're going to talk today about an open source approach to modernizing market risk management. And I'm joined on stage here with Marius. Marius, would you like to introduce yourself? Thanks, Eric. My name is Marius Bogovici. I'm a Chief Architect in the North America FSI team at Red Hat. I've been a long time open source, first user, then contributor, and now kind of part of the more like helping our customers uh, modernize their applications. Um, and first, the reason why we're here today, right? The kind of the very reason, um, the reason why we're here today and having this conversation is because of tremendous evolution that open source software had over the years. And kind of moving from being a tool to democratize technology to an enabler of innovation. And that innovation happens around, like, on two coordinates. One, really getting better and more interesting technologies. Like, think about something like Kubernetes, for example. We talk about a lot of other things here, but when you think about something like that, it came from the open source community, right? And when it did, it didn't just do that. It enabled new types of business solutions that solved business problems and started creating business value. And you know, while a lot of the technologies that you see on this map are things that we're going to talk today and so show how we're gluing together as part of this architecture, you know, the real story here is you know, how we can help, how we help uh, creating new innovative business solutions for managing credit market and credit risk you know, with open source. So I'm going to hand it over to Eric to talk a little bit about the business domain. So before we get started, a little show of hands. How many people are involved currently in risk management, helping either develop, develop models, supporting the risk management team? Some, okay. Uh, so let's spend a few minutes then, I'll just give you a little background so everyone's on the same page with regard to risk management. So risk management is the practice of understanding the risk to an organization so that you can then mitigate that risk and not blow up the firm. Very simple, okay? More detailed explanation on, on the screen. So that being said, there's multiple types of risk that a financial institution will come across. Today we'll talk about market risk. Similarly, there's credit risk, when the model we're showing here can be also be applied to credit risk. We won't talk about other types of risks, such as reg risk, um, operational risk, strategy risk, and so on and so forth, but those exist under the umbrella of risk management. So if you come across the term risk management in a bank, it is a fairly large term. We're going to focus here really on market risk. So how does a bank or any FSI understand the risk to them for market risk? One approach is something called value at risk, VAR, people refer to it as. And that's an understanding of, based on correlations, based on history, what is a likely move in the markets, and how would that negatively or positively affect you? And it's expressed as something along the lines of, in a one-day VAR, in 99% of the cases, my risk, my loss, will not exceed X. And, and that X is then defined possibly by a risk committee, the board of directors. It might be $100 million for a large global bank. It may be $5 million for a smaller hedge fund. But that is within 99% of the time, in one day, the most I'm likely to lose is X. It doesn't tell you the max loss. It's, in a probabilistic way, what I, can I likely lose? And that's all done in a math-based math way. There's Monte Carlo simulations where you can run 1,000, 5,000, 100,000 different simulations to test different things, and then you look at the correlations, uh, excuse me, the, the, the confidence intervals of that risk and see what you're likely to lose. Some more interesting approaches are agent-based modeling, um, where you can take different actors and what, what they do would impact others and how that works. Uh, climate risk is a good way to do agent-based modeling, and there's firms that focus on that. So to get here today, what Marius and I have done is we've talked to a number of our customers, a number of our partners, and really surveyed and said, what are the challenges you have today? And what we heard is really key, three key themes. One being an increasing complexity of risk models. Whether it's things like FRTB, whether it's things like climate risk, the models are getting more complex because life is complex, computers are getting faster, we want to model what happens in the real world. 
There's a need to bring in other types of data, not just market data, not just prices, but rather maybe it's a weather model, maybe it's sentiment, and other types of things you want to bring into that, collectively referred to as alt data. We want to be more agile. You know, as a firm, we want to release things more quickly. We don't want to spend six months doing something. We want to bring things as quickly as possible from the minds of our developers and our quants into production in a safe and efficient way. And banks being banks, we want to be efficient about this. Where do we run this? Do we run it on-prem? Do we run it in the cloud? Do we run it in a serverless? Do we run it in a distributed way? Do we run it in VMs? Do we run it in Kubernetes? We don't know, but we want to be agile about this, and we want to be able to be efficient about where we run this. So that really, that's what's driving. That's what we heard from people. So based on that, you know, what we've done is we've gone back and we envisioned from the ground up what a new architecture would look like. And that is event-driven in real time. It's no longer acceptable to run your risk once a day. Markets move during the day. Positions are put on during the day. The idea that, OK, my risk was you know, so-and-so at, at 5 PM at London closed yesterday. And now I have no idea where I am. That's not acceptable. It's got to be real time. And it's got to be based on more than just market data. Again, this alt data comes in. That's going to you know, make me better understand what my risk is. I want to incorporate that. We want to incorporate lines of business applications. What if a portfolio manager, for example, wants to say, I'm working with the clients. I'm working with my desk. If I change this and this, what does my risk look like? Is it better or is it worse? We want to do that, obviously, in real time. We want to be able to do these ad hoc things. Again, not wait for the end of day. We want to be agile about this. How do we move models from the brains of our quants into production as quickly as possible? You know, we heard from some tier one banks that it takes them six to nine months for that to happen. That's really unacceptable. You know, markets are moving. You look at the oil, oil, oil sector. Things are moving constantly. There's, you know, between Ukraine and the heat wave in Texas and so on and so forth, energy markets move. You want to be able to build models that incorporate what's happening, understand your risk, and move on to the next problem. And obviously, you want to be efficient about this. Reduce the total cost of ownership and avoid vendor lock-in. And the avoiding vendor lock-in, I, mean, I don't need to tell everybody here, that's a key part of the open source you know, ethos. The ability for us to understand what we're doing, to have the code there for us to iterate on, to improve upon, to contribute back. So I'm going to hand it off to Marius next. Sure. Thanks, Eric. So kind of coming back to the solution and coming back to the conversation that we had in the beginning, what technologies, what advancements, what new characteristics do these systems, can these systems incorporate to actually start solving the problems that Eric was talking about? Right? And we have, we have new technologies, we have new options, um, things like you know, the ability to bring you know, real-time streaming to be to build event-driven architectures you know, that, kind of, that, collect, that connect the different parts uh, of the system, because really, these really are, connect, are complex systems, not only internally, but also with, with a line of business applications to trigger, for example, risk calculations in real time whenever we need it, right? Um, or to um, you know, trigger them, for example, in response to certain changes in the market. Right? We're going to talk a bit later about that. We have different options to integrate data from a variety of sources using, you know, Things like APIs, for example, um, for, for bringing data from, from, you know, from the line of business, from external sources, from, from wherever data is, into the application. Um, and of course, we have, the, we have technologies that enable us to be scalable, right? the adoption of hybrid cloud architectures, where workloads can run on-premise, on, you know, in the cloud, uh, can run on the edge, but also you know, have the op opportunity to uh, combine, for example, existing investment in risk calculation processes and making them more efficient, moving them to a different environment with new components. So using things like, you know, containers, virtual machines, um, you know, serverless technologies. Technology is one thing. The other one is concerns the processes and, you know, the qualitative improvements that we make into this. And, you know, applying automation, for example, uh, you know, how do you solve the problem of, of moving a model in less than six months, right? Through automation. It's, 
the kind of the software industry has developed practices like DevSecOps, for example, that are perfectly applicable to, to uh, risk model development. Right? So incorporating those lessons into the build deployment workflow helps us reduce the time to value. Also, you know, starting to incorporate new types of you know, new, new options like uh, accelerated hardware, things like you know, GPUs, for example. And when you do that, how do you figure out how you run applications like how do you run these hybrid solutions that combine CPU and GPU components? And how do you run them transparently? So having this, like thinking about how to, how to run these things is, is critically important. And finally, you know, how do you incorporate things like artificial intelligence? How do you, how do you add more, you know, how, you, how do you add more intelligence in the way you consume the input data, the way you handle this? Um, you know, the way you manage your processes, the way you, you, you parse your results. So all these things are part of this kind of general solution that we envision. Again, this is not some sort of a grand plan. It's not of a drop-in replacement. This is the distillation, as, as Eric has mentioned, of the work that we did uh, with our clients, with our partners, uh, to understand what is the journey that, um, you know, that institutions take to modernize their market and credit risk. And can uh, I add one, so one point, just to be perfectly clear, Red Hat doesn't have a risk management product. Exactly. <laughs> not a SKU that we're selling, nothing like that. It's all about how do we incorporate open source technology to solve problems for our clients in the risk management space. That's a very, that's a very important point. And I think we, we are very emphatic about that. Yeah. Um, and it is, I think, one of the key things there and where it ties to the open source ethos is that this is an open architecture. It is designed, we're going to talk about different components and solutions that fit in there and give examples of technologies, but realistically it is designed to, to take an, uh, a financial institution on a transformational journey. Like take what they have right now, add new things, incorporate what exists, uh, you know, be able to choose uh, from the different available technologies what works best uh, what, was, what works best for, for them, right? We're gonna, because this journey, like one of the things that we found out when we talked to, uh, when we talked to our clients was nobody's doing this transformation wholesale. Like there is no way to kind of take this and build it and you know, take this kind of moonshot project of doing everything um, at once. It's more like incremental. Therefore, we have a number of themes that we're gonna walk you through which capture you know, the different portions of the journey or the different paths that organizations take to, actually, to, to modernize their market and credit risk and we'll discuss the kind of the appropriate open source technologies. And that's a reflection on the conversations we had with different clients. We broke it into themes based on their challenges. You exactly. know? And, and as Mary steps through it, you'll see that there's specific fixes, you know, solutions to those challenges that, that we thematically heard. Right. Before, that, before we go that, I just want to kind of give you a bit of a lay of the land of this, of this solution, right? What you see at the top is your typical risk calculation uh, process. Data comes in from different sources, is brought into a compute system, it is stored for consumption, um, and then, you know, it is also kind of stored for, it's archived for, for audit and, you know, for, for backtesting. But, to solve all these other problems of real-time access, of, of, of how do you do better around uh, processing these results, we have an intelligent automation, uh, intelligent orchestration layer that kind of coordinates these things and adds some, some business process intelligence around it. To make these things work, we have an event-driven platform that moves you know, internal and external events, business events, and, and, and you know, um, application-relevant events through it. And to top it all, we have artificial intelligence that adds, as I said, intelligence in processing data, uh, input data, uh, orchestrating the processes, and of course, handling uh, you know, and connecting with, uh, with the, the external applications and line of business, kind of giving the right advice to the business stakeholders. So let's start going through the themes, I think. You got it. The first one, I think, and it's common, probably the most common one that comes in this conversation, is hybrid cloud. And why? Because risk calculation is, by definition, a compute-intensive process. Like Monte Carlo simulation should say, though. Right? So 
very, um, you know, a lot of the kind of, a lot of the existing investment is high performance computing. Now, in order to get better results, in order to uh, get results faster, you know, there is a need to acquire more compute capacity. And very often institutions, what they do, they go to the cloud. They burst this workload and try to figure out, um, you know, how they work there. When you do that, you end up with you know, different environments, you did, with different ways of managing this. So reducing the friction of, of running in different environments to make it easier, for example, to move things from one environment to the other, uh, there are you know, components, like there are technologies like containerization and uh, container orchestration platforms. Things like you know, Linux, for example, has been an early component for providing a uniform platform for run things. Kubernetes added even more abstraction, uh, you know, allowing to run things like um, containers, even virtual machines to kubevert, serverless to components like Knative, and essentially kind of ch allowing you to pick and choose what's your best technology for running your, um, yeah, your risk calculation processes, right? It, uh, you know, it enables, for example, uh, support for CPUs and GPUs that we were talking about earlier. So, you know, just, you know, just enabling this part and enabling the and kind of the... If I can add one thing as well. Yeah. What's important is that in conversations we have a number of clients who are challenged with SLAs. There's so much happening in terms of volumes in the market, you know, new products. They're hitting up against their SLAs and they're looking to, you know, do some short-term tactical things that'll give them 5%, 10% more capacity because they're constraining the data center in terms of cooling you know, and power, that going to the cloud solves that problem. It also reduces their costs, because now instead of running things 24 by seven, they can run them for maybe the eight hours, the 12 hours where they're doing compute for the risk. Sure, and you know, the other challenge that we've seen, and is related to that, is introducing new types of processes, side by side to existing ones. Right? They, have a, they have an existing platform, for example, for doing risk calculation that they've been kind of building since, you know, uh, for backtesting, but how do you do new things like climate risk? How do you create new models? Do you run on the same platform or do you do some new things? And when you do that, how do you do things side by side? Want to take intelligent orchestration? Intelligent orchestration. So this is a piece that, that's super interesting to me. Um, the idea is that how do we orchestrate all these pieces? You know, there's a lot to happen to calculate risk. Beyond just the mathematical models, you have get data from uh, golden sources, the transactional systems, which are typically on-prem. How do you transform that data and normalize it? Your FX system have a different schema than your fixed income, than your equities. How do you bring it to where your compute is, put it into a cache, run those calculations, and then when you're done, archive the stuff, your inputs, your outputs, and the version of your models. How do you react to what happened, meaning that is there a breach in your VAR, and what do you do there? And that's an important piece, because in order to mitigate the risk, it's more than just knowing what the risk is, but what do you do with it? And there's been a number of failures you know, over the last decades, whether it's you know, the crypto firms recently, whether it is uh, firms that were hit with Archegos or long-term capital management you know, you know, probably a few decades ago, what happens when you do a breach or you get near a breach? So if you're in a warning zone, for example, with a client on margin, do you notify the relationship manager? So he or she can talk up front with that customer, hey, we need to post more collateral, we need to bring down some of your positions. If he or she doesn't respond to that alert, it gets escalated to his or her manager. And ultimately, once they're under margin, you can go and clear out that position, close the position, or hedge the position, or do what you need to do full, in a fully automated way. So by comparison, I mean, 15 years ago or so, I was an FX firm. We calculated our margin risk every second for every position, <laughs> never suf suffered a debit loss because we were always on top of that customer. And importantly also, it helps the customer because if we're doing this in real time, then that customer is not getting a debit balance. They're not gonna get a bill from us to say, you owe us a million dollars, you owe us $10 million. So you're helping the customer in terms of their experience as well. So all of that should be automated. All that should be with rules. So when your internal audit comes in, you can say very simply, here's the rules. 
here's what we ran, here were the inputs, here were the outputs, here were the versions of the models we ran, and it's all very transparent and all very clear. And that's, a, I would argue, a very key tenant of a modern risk management system. Back to you, sir. Thank you. I would add here to what Eric has been saying, that this is probably one of the places where artificial intelligence can, pay, can play a key role. Because what we've seen, for example, from, you know, from talking to our customers, is not just about uh, getting the data and producing a ton of results. It's the way you interpret them, the way you handle uh, you know, a large volume of, of data. You have, like we were talking about with banks that have like 7,000 dashboards. You're producing more results, what do you want? Probably not more dashboards. <laughs> you want someone to kind of go through and sift through that data, separate signal from noise, and make you understand you know, what, what's going on in there. And that is part of the intelligent orchestration too, and that intelli introducing that intelligence into the process is a key piece here. Now, of course, we have data, like we have processes running in, in the cloud and locally. We have you know, this intelligent orchestration process. How do, we, how, how do we manage, how do we bring the data to the computation? And this is the place where you know, uh, storage and performance and modern storage and caching solutions play a key role. Caching brings essentially data close to the computation. Like these are very, very intensive require, computations, require low latency access, they do a lot of churning, they do a lot of work. You want to have the data there. Um, you want to have essentially also, you want to have data stored in your file systems in such a way that if you're moving, for example, the workload from, you know, from local to the hybrid cloud, you still have the data accessible in these different places. When you do that, you have to do it with consideration to security. Right? This is like, you know, this is very confidential data. Maybe not PII, but it still contains, for example, uh, proprietary information on how the bank does its calculations. So enabling that, you know, enabling this, <clears throat> you know, access across different clouds, enabling uh, you know, a, a seamless integration between the kind of the file system, the cache layer is, is very, very important here. And, and this a, is an area of evolution. And, that, and that's an important piece also we're talking about, you talked before about the open source aspect of this, that really what we're looking to help banks modernize, you know, so I mean, I see, for example, our, our friends from Hazelcast, you know, that's a, that's a place, where, place where you can plug in the caches there. I mean, really it's agnostic about what do we do that's best for that customer, where their investment lies, how they leverage technologies such as Hazelcast or Infinispan or something else, so. Yes. Sure. What well, I would argue for the risk models, you, you need to understand what is it, the inputs you need, and all of that should be in the cache. So you're probably talking about a larger cache. So we have a conversation with one, uh, one firm this week. They keep 74 days for their, their uh, look back for VAR to do correlation. So 74, maybe 180 or something like that. But once you start going to disk off that cache, the, the VAR models are going to be run much more slowly. Uh, if you're happy, I mean, after we can have a deeper conversation. <laughs> happy to take that conversation. It, it's a great point, though. Like, it's part of the, and we didn't enter in all the details, but happy to have that conversation afterward. Yeah. And it depends on asset class as well. You know, options for 30 years would be enormous. You know, equities would be less so. Um, now, as we solve the problems of, of where the computation happens, you know, how we orchestrate things, how we move the data, where we store it, um, comes, how do we put all these things together? You know, as I said, this is an open architecture. It's modular. It's composed of multiple parts. So getting the different pieces to talk to each other requires a, decomp like, requires a decomposed, I said, I said it again, modular architecture and event-driven uh, architectures are probably the best way to, to connect things together. Event-driven architecture does not just give you the kind of um, the composability and you know, the option to replace and evolve different parts independently also solves problems of real time, uh, real time computation. How do you trigger, for example, a computation in real time? 
when we talk about events, we don't, we don't just talk about technical events or messages, right? We're talking about business events. We're talking about um, internal kind of internal events, like a computation has ended. What do I do now? Uh, we're talking about events that are produced, for example, by the intelligent orchestration layer. I detected a, a breach. What do I do now? We talk about events, for example, synthetically produced from the alternative data. Market moves in a certain way. This means, for example, like there is, you know, the kind of the, you know, the uh, Twitter, for example, is, is, is suing um, uh, Elon Musk right now. How does that, what does that mean for my market and for my risk calculation process? Like interpreting and incorporating that and translating that into, into triggers for the risk calculation is a key piece here. And this is also, again, a place for artificial intelligence. Like applying you know, technologies like sentiment analysis or you know, NLP, for example, for parsing things like uh, ESG reports or uh, parsing things like, um, you know, uh, parsing things like speech, like analyzing you know, the voice patterns in, in certain earnings calls, for example, produce valuable data that is, uh, that is, in, uh, that is introduced in the system, right? So I think the, the last but not least, we have another kind of slide here which presents you a different view of this entire process, not just from the kind of, not just from the uh, kind of how the system is structured, but how the different personas can work together to, to solve this problem of acceleration of uh, delivering the model time to value. You know, the key idea is that you know, we want to enable a quick turnaround from getting data from the line of business, getting in the hands of, of quants to analyze it, enabling, like taking those models quickly in the hands of developers to build applications, deploying them for production, and basically kind of enabling this continuous virtuous cycle uh, of moving data through the system, right? With that said, um, I think uh, we're at the end of our presentation, but I would love to start uh, and get some questions from you. Yeah, questions, and uh, if anybody would like a copy of the slides, I'm happy, happy to share them. Just, you know, give me your contact info and we can share them. And if you're, like, we're here right now. <laughs> we're gonna be here for the rest of the day, so don't be shy. Um, and, but if you wanna talk to us personally, you can find us in the, in the attendance. So, thank you very much. I'm sorry, there was a, uh, there was a question? Oh, thumbs up. I like oh, thumbs, thumbs up. up. Okay. But thank you all. I appreciate that. I'll take that as a question. <laughs> thank you.